Amen. Didn't they do a good job? <clears throat> uh, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're kids to, uh, to do that when there's nobody in here and then to be able to do it and just stand there and look at y'all. Once upon a time, it was terrifying for me too. And uh, I got over it somehow. Uh, this morning, uh, we're, going, we're going to uh, look at the promised one. Uh, looking at eight uh, Christmas prophecies, quote unquote, uh, Christmas prophecies uh, regarding the Messiah. Uh, with each one, we're going to look at the Old Testament prophecy with the New Testament fulfillment. For the past three weeks, we've looked at the Christmas story uh, as it really happened. We tried to look at it in chronological order to kind of give you the totality of what had taken place. So much is left out. Uh, just like in this song that w was sang here today, and I was sitting over there going, one, Two, three. I said, man, should have had five or six or two wise men. But you know, the song said three when they sang it in there. Um, but uh, to be able to, uh, I've seen some Facebook posts, one or two, uh, with, with some things people had mentioned and some people were commenting. Uh, and it's just flabbergasting to me almost at how much people still, it's a shocker to them whenever they hear that there may have been more than three wise men, when they hear that there was no innkeeper uh, conversation in the Bible, when they hear that there's nothing that says Mary rode on a donkey, even though, I mean, she may have, but there's so much that people, that they'll go, yeah, it's in that particular scripture. And, and as much as I've talked about it, you know, obviously I'm not speaking to the whole world, uh, but I'll see people that I know and somebody will say something, they'll go, well, I, I, just, I, I really thought there was a conversation between Mary and Joseph and an innkeeper in the Bible. No, there's, there's not. You know, so if you want to look at that aspect of the Christmas story, uh, then you can go back and look at it. You can read it in the Bible. But today, we're going to look at the promised one, the Messiah. Uh, first prophecy, we're going to take a look at the virgin birth. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. What is this sign? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Uh, this happened uh, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. It says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We talked about this a little bit before. We looked at the virgin birth. We went through on the uh, past several Wednesday nights about Jesus and myth and legend, about what some uh, crazy things that people believe about uh, the, the birth of Jesus and who he was and who he may have been and all these types of things. Um, but that uh, word, virgin, in Isaiah uh, is the Hebrew word Alma. And they're even, uh, in the, and Linda brought this up to me the other day, but they're even in, in our songs. What is the song, uh, Linda, uh, Heart the Herald Angels Sing? Okay, you know when it says, offspring of a virgin's womb. You know they changed that now? And it's offspring of a favored one. Yeah, tons of Christians are singing it that way too. Well, let me put it to you this way. I don't care how you read it. You can study it in the Greek. You can study it in uh, the Hebrew. The word Alma means young woman of maritable age. Guess what? Young women that were of maritable age but had not been married yet, guess what they hadn't done? And there's a lot of kids in here, so let's just keep this PG, okay? They hadn't been with anybody, Okay? So then you have Matthew coming along in, in his uh, gospel in chapter 1 using the Greek word that means she hadn't been with anybody. This, you can't explain away the Bible. It doesn't mean Mary was just young. It means she had never been with a man. The whole interaction between her and Joseph, you see that? The whole context tells you that that is the way the situation was, Okay. Now, you have to deal with what the scripture says. And I just want to put it to you this way. If Mary was not a virgin, then Jesus is not the Savior. 
It's as simple as that. He didn't fulfill the prophecy. If he didn't fulfill the prophecy, he is not the Messiah, then he's not the Savior, and we are lost and undone today. So that goes for every one of the things that we're going to read uh, today. The scripture is what the scripture is. That he's Abraham's seed, the number, number two. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to jump to verse 7. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. That word offspring uh, is really seed. Okay, you're, if you've got a study Bible or probably any kind of Bible, it probably has a note there and it probably tells you that that's what that Hebrew word right there means, seed, seed uh, in the singular. In Galatians 3, 16, uh, Paul writes to the church at Galatia and he says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his what? Seed, it says. Uh, and it says, Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but you, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. You see that? You see how Paul is linking up uh, the promised one of Abraham and his seed to whom? Linking it to who? Very last word. Christ. All right. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, we have the genealogy that is there. In the very beginning of Matthew, it says, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the whom? The son of Abraham. Okay. Uh, the Bible prophesied that from this seed of Abraham would come this great offspring that would bless the entire world. The New Testament reveals to us that that person is Jesus Christ, and the Bible painstakingly, as you're reading in Matthew and it reads the genealogy, read in Luke the genealogy, why are they there? They're there to show you that here is the evidence that he goes back and fulfills this prophecy. Not only was he going to be uh, Abraham's seed, but he's going to be, a de be descended from Judah. In Genesis 49, 10, it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he uh, to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Uh, in Luke 3, 33, it says, The son of Abinadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. Uh, so here you have Jesus again uh, in the genealogy. He is from the line of of Judah. That's going to be very important. If you don't come from the line of Judah, you're not going to come from the line of David. That is prophecy number four. He's descended uh, from David. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verses 12 and 13, and then jumping to verse 16, it says, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. Now, if you stop right there, that's no big deal. I mean, David had a son. His name was Solomon. Solomon became king after David died. Solomon is it's about to say something else that Solomon did. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Solomon did that, right? David didn't get to build the, te the temple, the house, uh, but Solomon did. Now, wh what about the last part, though? And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What happened after Solomon died? Did the kingdom just keep on going with his son and stay together? No, the kingdom got split. Okay? Uh, and, and, his, and, his, and his throne did not last forever. So parts of this certainly are uh, to, to Solomon, but it's speaking of something even greater than that. In verse 16, it says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. You say, well, that, you know, that's just Samuel. That's just Samuel talking. Well, Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16 says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. 
He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, this branch, the Lord our righteous Savior. Hmm. Luke 1, 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, all right. So we, we have four prophecies that the Bible is claiming that Jesus has fulfilled uh, just in him being born. All right. Um, he's, he, he's, he's born of a virgin. He couldn't, he, he couldn't do that himself. He's born uh, as a part of Abraham's line. He's born uh, as a part of the tribe of Judah. He's born uh, as, as, as someone who is in, in the line of David. All of those things are tremendously important. I'll say the same thing about them as I said about the first one. If one isn't true, then all of this stuff we're doing is a lie. That's just a fact. That's the way it goes. Um, and verse 5, said he'd be born in Bethlehem. There were two. In Micah 5, 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Uh, it's mighty curious in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. You see it says that? Boy, if they had left out that in Judea, we would be kind of wondering. Because there were two Bethlehems that he could have been born in. Bethlehem in Bethlehem of Judea is the same Bethlehem. He read it from Matthew 5. During the time of King Herod, and it says Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. So there again, we know that he was, it was prophesied he'd be born in Bethlehem in Judea. He was born in Bethlehem in Judea. Now where was Jesus, where was uh, Joseph and Mary living at when, 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 when she conceived the child? Come on now, be, be, be confident. Nazareth. So, what happened that they got to Bethlehem for him to be born there? The census that Luke talks about when Quirinius was governor of Syria, you know, a census was to be taken, and they all had to travel over there. You see how it all had to, it all had to correlate to why all of this is there? They had to get to Bethlehem. They had to get to Bethlehem. That's where he had to be born. If he was born in Nazareth, that would have only fulfilled some. Wouldn't have fulfilled all. Okay? Um, and then I've got a typo in your, in your paper notes. Probably in the online ones too. But it's not our of Egypt, but it's out of Egypt. Thank you, Joe, for catching that and changing it on the slide for me. But Hosea 11.1, 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 uh, it says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay here until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and was so fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Most all of these in the scripture is telling you this happened to fulfill this. Uh, so you have six prophecies so far that, uh, from the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, 700 years or so in, the, uh, in Isaiah and the differences of the prophecies there, hundreds of years between these other uh, prophecies from the Old Testament, and here you have Jesus uh, fulfilling according to the New Testament. And uh, uh, number seven is the killing of the children. In Jeremiah 31 verse 15, it says, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, and in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, it says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Now, hold on a minute. I want to... I burned through some of these. What do those two have anything in common about? Does it say anything in Jeremiah 31, 15 about Herod killing anybody in Bethlehem? Why is that a prophecy then? It 
It's an open book test. Huh? No. Yeah, but I mean, you can't make a prophecy just about dead children. There's something in the prophecy uh, uh, in, uh, in here that is linking this to Bethlehem. Huh? Rachel. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, very good. Rachel weeping for her children. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the prophecy. Rachel's children. Rachel, go back and read. Read your Old Testament and you would have seen that. Uh, Here again, let me stop for just a moment. You know, some people can criticize and some people can say, well, you know, that's just crazy. Anybody can take the scriptures. The Jewish people, who wrote the New Testament? I mean, let's just get baseline. Men, right? Human beings, specifically men. And, and, And what kind of religion were they from? They were Jews, okay? Jewish men believed... 2,000 years ago, and let's just, you know, let's not even say it's true, but they believed that Jesus and what happened here with King Herod was a fulfillment of this Jeremiah 31 prophecy. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm going to trust, hey, they were reading it, though, and I'll say this again here in a little bit, they read it, they put it out there, and they said, this is a fulfillment of this prophecy uh, uh, for, for Rachel mourning and great weeping and crying out for her children. So you have seven uh, prophecies that the New Testament says Jesus fulfilled. Number eight, a messenger would precede him. Uh, in Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Uh, in Malachi Uh, Chapter 3 and verse 1, it says specifically, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord uh, you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So why do we have Luke uh, uh, and and Matthew, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 3, it says in verses 1 and 2, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You can read all of that. It goes and says, he's the one fulfilling this, uh, uh, this prophecy here. So you have eight prophecies total that Jesus fulfilled um, uh, and being born, none of which could he have orchestrated for him to be able to do this. Uh, and I put some things in the bottom of your notes here, some that I've said some time ago, But uh, the probability of one person, one human being, fulfilling eight biblical prophecies of the Messiah is one in ten to the seventeenth power. And I put the number in your notes, okay? That is 100 quadrillion. Uh, If you, if you, I believe the guy that came up with that number said if you, you could take, um, so many silver dollars, I I believe it was two silver dollars, and stack them up on each other, it could cover the entire state of Texas, all right, with a hundred quadrillion silver dollars, something like that. And he said, so what's the probability that he put one X on one of those silver dollars and put you out there and said, you know, hey, go find that one. One in a hundred quadrillion that one person fulfilled eight. Now, if you look, there are over 300 messianic prophecies. I don't know the probability of one person fulfilling all 300. I don't know if somebody's tried to get the math number to be there. But they have gone to 48, and that's one to 10 to the 157th power. So that means one out of 10 with 157 zeros behind it. That one person fulfilled all of that. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Kind of impossible to 
make yourself virgin born. I mean, I think that's impossible. You know, and people sit back, especially younger people today, and they'll say, you know, that people question these things, and they'll, they'll question the Bible, and they'll, they'll say, well, yeah, that couldn't be. These, these men got together, and, and, and they figured all this stuff out, and they wrote it all down, and, and all that. They made Isaiah write Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus? I don't think so. Isaiah writes in, 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 in chapter 53 the prophecies about how the, this suffering servant would die. And you think Jesus... And this is possible for you to think this, that Jesus read Isaiah, of course he certainly did. And he said, I'm going to go do that. Pierce for their transgressions, crush for their iniquities. I think crucifixion's in my life. Yeah. You can believe that, many people do. He's a liar, lunatic, or Lord. Maybe you think he was a lunatic. He, he would have certainly had to be if that's what he did. But he couldn't have done all the rest of these other things. And some people will explain it away. They'll say, well, those were prophecies that were really fulfilled back then, and they have nothing to do with the future. They're, not, they're just things people are looking for. Well, folks, I didn't come up with that idea. And we're not talking about it in 2023 saying this. We're saying that in the very beginning of our New Testament, which encompasses John 3, 16, right? You know, the verse... The very first chapters are devoted to laying out the case so clearly that he is the fulfillment of prophecy. Every word of it, the genealogies of Matthew, the story that Matthew lays out, what Luke goes to lay out, these ancient Jewish people that, that delivered to us the New Testament look back and said, we're, we've read our own scriptures. We know our scriptures back and forward. And these are prophecies about this coming Messiah. And give you some more evidence that, that, that they've always been looking for a Messiah. We, Jesus didn't create the idea of a Messiah, did he? When Jesus of Nazareth showed up, was that the first time anybody ever heard about a Messiah coming? The Jews have been looking for a Messiah forever, haven't they? Since the first moment when they were exiled... And God was delivering some wrath to them. They were looking for a Messiah. Guess what? Some of them still are. The Jewish people absolutely believe that the scriptures are teaching that there's going to be a Messiah. They read these same scriptures. And yes, those scriptures have meanings that are applicable to the place at the time. But they believe they have further meaning down the road. And I just want you to understand uh, something today uh, that... I say it every year. It, it, it is appalling to me, really, when you look at this time of year, how ignorant we are of this particular story. <clears throat> Could it have, how do you get to the cross? If you don't, if you don't get, if you're not born. Could, you, you can't have Easter without Christmas. And I tell you, and I tell you, and I tell you, that look at this. Look at it. Even, even if you're sitting here so skeptical of any of this stuff, that any of this stuff is real, that somehow, I, lo I love to, I, and maybe there's somebody here today, and I wish that there, there are, so I could meet somebody like this, I love to meet people that totally believe the Bible was written just by men, orchestrated just by men, and it has no authority whatsoever. I, I really love to meet people that way. I want to go, what a real poor job we've done of writing it about ourselves. I mean, if men really did write this book, wouldn't you have scrubbed some stuff out? Wouldn't you have changed some stuff? It makes human beings look pretty stupid. Makes us look pretty weak. Makes us look pretty evil. Impotent. Boy, if we wrote it, I mean, I've seen books written by, oh, they, yes, everybody's good. Everybody's great. There is no, everything's light. And you're reading those books going, what planet are you living on? When I read the Bible, 
I'm going, yeah, I see people act like this all the time. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Now, I, 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 granted, I had not walked on water yet. Maybe if I lose a little weight, who knows? Well, you know what, Jim? I almost did in the Dead Sea. I couldn't get up, I tell you that. I couldn't get up. I felt like a turtle on the back. It was, it was already hard to get out of the recliner. It's sure hard to, you got to throw everything forward and hope you don't land the other way because you sure can't get up either. Dangerous. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I guess I've almost walked on word in 37% salt or whatever it is. Um, but, but folks, when you look at this probability, I mean, the Bible, God has given us this book. And, I, and I've been talking about this on Wednesday nights. It has been here for people to rip it to shreds, to tear it apart, every verse by verse, word by word. Who wrote it? When did they write it? How can we understand that? I mean, the, the literary criticism has been crazy on this book. I mean, people have absolutely tried to destroy it. The facts of the matter are this. It's 40 different authors, and it took 1,500 years to write this book. They did not all sit down with each other and go, what were you writing? Let me see. <laughs> Do that. Some of them could have. I'm not saying some of them, you know, some of them, I'm saying the totality of the book. But you take 1,500 years worth of documents written by 40 different people, you cram them all together, and some people say, well, we're going to exclude that one, we're going to exclude that one, take this one out. These are the 66 we're going to have. And you start reading them, and they make sense together. And you say, well, they only make sense because those those other books you took out of there. If that's your view, go back and look at my Wednesday night messages for the past three weeks. I read from you some of the stuff that they say they took out. This Gospel of Thomas and Philip. Go ahead. We have all the documents. We have everything that people say we took out. And you can read it. And you can put it back in. The Catholics put in some stuff. That it's all here for you. I want you to put, I want to put it to you, there's no way. We have more logical evidence about Christmas than we do about Easter. Because there's all of this documentation of what has taken place about Jesus Christ and who he is. And you have a lot of that for Easter as well. But the Bible has put all of this out here for you so you can go against, because I believe that there's no doubt that Jesus knew. When you look at the world, and, you, and, and I was meaning to say this earlier, if you're sitting here saying all of this is a farce, all of this isn't true, or whatever the case may be, or you have family that believes that way, why is the world and why does Satan seem to fight so hard against the two most important holy days, Christmas and Easter. The world so wants their Christmas, but he can't say Christmas. They want to get the presents, and they want to have all of this. Stuff. They so want the Easter stuff, but we have to, we have to include, I'm not going to spoil it. I know some people sit on the edge of this thing, he's going to spoil something. Um, I am aware Okay, but we create all of these things out here where nobody cares, and it's a travesty to me that there are people that even sit in this church after every year I give these speeches and sermons, and you don't, you ought to know the Christmas story backwards and forwards, Okay. You ought to know what happened. You ought to know when the Magi come and ask some of these questions about, you know, what, what was going on. You ought to know if somebody says to you, well, I was reading in the Bible about that conversation between the innkeeper and Mary and Joseph. You say, no, you wasn't. You watched that in a movie. Were they in a stable? What, what, you know, what, do we know if any cow slobbered on the baby Jesus? You ever been to one of those things where they feed the animals out of your door? You seen what those things would get on your hands? Ugh. Was he in a stable with animals? We don't know that. We don't know that cattle are lowing the... What's lowing mean? Yeah, yeah. 
They, do you know, if, were there cattle there? We don't know that. We know he was born in a manger, a feeding trough. That's the extent of it. So many things people believe that aren't in there, but they don't even know what is really in there. That's so odd to me. It's odd to me we know things that aren't there, but we don't know things that are. Satan's done a good job, folks. He's done a really good job. And here's what I need you to leave with today. When you are going home, you're at your celebration, you're, you're something. Please, please, can this be, can this be the center point of what in your celebration can you read something from this to your family can you let your kids and your grand can you let somebody know that this book is the reason why this story is the reason why we're doing any of this stuff i mean just take take one i don't care take one verse i don't care something but for it to just say well you today you come to church and so he said, oh, I went to church, it's Christmas. I brought a Bible with me so people know that I had one. But you zip it up, you put it on the shelf, and the next, this whole week, we don't ever think about the Bible again. That's why we're ignorant about the story. Because that's all we're willing to put, put, put into it. Your kids, this book has changed lives. And Satan knew that. So what he said was, I'll let be translated into every known language, just about. And not even just in your language, in your vernacular, in your reading level. You can hear it, you can see it, you can watch it on tape. It's accessible right on your phone for free to listen to it, to look at every translation that's out there that people did. The most accessible that it has ever been in human history. Yet the illiteracy rate is the highest. How do you explain that? You look at the world, you can see the literacy rate of our country when it comes to the Bible and knowing what the Bible says and living up according to its doctrines. Uh, I'll end with this. I was watching, boy, I didn't intend to do this, but I need to. I was watching Mother Angelica. She was on EWTN a long time ago, a Catholic nun. Uh, she used to do a program, and I used to see it when I was a kid, and by no means am I Catholic. But a guy called into her show in like the late 80s, early 90s, and he said, Mother Angelica, I'm struggling uh, because I'm a gay man, and I'm having a hard time being Catholic. And I sat up and I said, oh, what you going to say, Mother? And she's listening, and she's going, and she's got her Bible in her hand, and she says this. You know, when you say I'm gay, she said, I really don't know what you mean. So it's kind of hard sometimes. Do you mean that you have an inclination to be gay? She said, because you can be a, a, a wonderful Catholic if you have an, just an inclination. She said, but if you are practicing your homosexuality, and by that you know what I mean. She didn't say that, that was my words. She said, then it's impossible because you're committing egregious sin against God. And I went, pow! Score, lady! From a Catholic. I thought she was going to say, it's all right, baby, just go do it. Say some Hail Marys and Our Fathers and you're good. No! Listen, folks. Listen. The Bible says this stuff and, and when you choose to explain any of it away, then who's to say any of it is worthwhile? And it says what it says, it means what it means, and I believe it, not just because somebody told me that, I believe it because I've studied it, and I've even put it side by side with other faiths. I've studied all the five major religions of the world, got friends and people that are Buddhist and all these other cults and things like this, and I've listened to all of that. And when I put them side by side, it's clear as a bell to me. They don't need to be hidden. God has painstakingly given us his word. And the more you put that word in the shadows, the more things are going to go in the dumps. Bring that word out. 
make his word important in his unabashed word. There's a lot, if I had editing rights, I'd rewrite the thing. I'd make it to where Corey could live however he wanted to and still get into heaven and be just cool. I'd love to do that. I'd love to say, listen, whatever I wanted to do, I get every, you know, I put one dollar in, I get a million back. That's not the way it works. I don't, I didn't write it, I can't rewrite it. I'm not going to try to, it works as it is. Make it important. And during Christmas, God, God has went through and he's just laid it all out for us that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the only one that you can call out his name and be saved. You can't call out yourself. You can't call out a family member. You can't call out a president, not even Trump. Don't tell him, he'll be mad at him. You can only call out Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, what a better time than to surrender your life right around when we celebrate his birthday. All right, let's pray. Father God, I praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We've read a lot of it. Father God, today, so much of it, Father God, needs to be gone back and, and read in its total context, Father God, to ensure that people are uh, understanding it fully. But Father, what we've tried to look at today is there's no doubt that your word prophesied that there would be a Savior. There would be a Christ. There would be a Messiah that would come your chosen people were looking for this Savior. Lord, uh, and when, Jesus, you showed up on the scene, the people were able to see the signs, the angels telling them about it. Lord, you've, you've documented how everything was orchestrated, Father, and how so many realized that you were the Messiah and that you were rejected. You ultimately were killed because that was a part of the plan as well. You had to die as a substitution, atoning sacrifice for every single one of our sins. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place today and as we go for our family uh, uh, gatherings, Father God, and we're celebrating this time, Lord, I pray that we would make it important to every member of our family, our children, our grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and all of our, all of our kin folks, that Lord, that this is a holy season that we are celebrating the time that you chose to take just a little bit of distance from the Father to come down, to be born of a, of a human being, to have that vulnerable state, to ultimately be raised up as Daryl sang in the song, for you to die on the perfect tree. And Lord, I just pray that every person in the sound of my voice knows you as their personal Savior because you have painstakingly paid a price for us to have that free gift of eternal life. Lord, if we have that gift today, I pray as we leave, we'll take it with us. We'll share it with other people, Father God. We'll share it with our friends and our family. And Lord, we'll be about your business. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the service, Lord, that we've been in today. Thank you for these children, Father God, and the leaders that's been with them. Uh, Lord, and we just pray blessings over every single person here and keep everyone safe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.